So, um, uh, welcome everybody uh, to, uh, I guess, what is our third installment of this uh, virtual sub I series put on by uh, Dr. Sean McAvoy, who is um, uh, our point person and director of uh, medical education for, um, for medical students in our department. Uh, Sophie Church, our program coordinator, is also on the line. And then it's a real pleasure that we're going to do this, uh, two of us. So, so Dr. Ralph Daisy and myself. And uh, uh, Ralph is going to start, uh, and then I'll finish up with some comments. But before he starts, let me just introduce him, you know, appropriately. So uh, make sure everybody knows, you know, who he is. Uh, Dr. Dacey uh, was uh, for 30 years the chair of the department at Wash U. Uh, before that, he trained at the University of Virginia for his residency with Dr. John Jane and uh, and other uh, and many others who you would recognize their names in terms of kind of the leadership that they uh, accomplished over the years. And, uh, and then he was at University of Washington in Seattle uh, uh, for about four or five years as a junior faculty. Then he went to the University of North Carolina to be the division chief uh, of neurosurgery there for a couple of years and then was recruited to be the uh, fourth chair of neurosurgery um, here at Washington University. And he had an illustrious 30-year career here with lots of accomplishments. And I'll review a few of those uh, in my talk. Um, and also had many, many uh, national and international leadership uh, positions, uh, uh, too numerous to, to name, but virtually every significant chair or presidency uh, he attained during that period of time. So what we're going to do tonight is Dr. Dacey is going to uh, talk uh, a little bit about how the department grew and some of his thoughts about uh, some things that are specific and unique about our program. Um, and then I will uh, uh, kind of introduce my own thoughts, including a vision for the future of where we're taking it since I'm I'm one year into my uh, time as the fifth chair of neurosurgery for, for the department. So with that, uh, Dr. Dacey, it's all yours. Thanks, Greg. Um, I, I apologize to you all. It's nice to meet you all. Uh, I apologize. I couldn't get my web camera working. It was working before, so I'm not sure what the problem is. Um, so I'd like to talk to you, as Greg said, about a little bit of our history in the department and my thoughts on the defining characteristics of our program. And then I wanna talk a little bit about Dr. Zipfel at the end. Um, so our history is interesting in that in the past 100 years, now 110 years, um, there've only been four department heads. Um, Dr. Ernest Sachs, who was a close colleague of Dr. Harvey Cushing, who in 1911 started the Society of Neurological Surgeons um, with Dr. Cushing and was the first secretary. Then Dr. Henry Schwartz um, was a very, very distinguished academic neurosurgeon. Um, he was a combat surgeon with Patton's Army in North Africa and Europe and uh, was just a wonderful technical surgeon a very tough guy, demanding guy, sort of appropriate for those times, but um, his, his trainees loved him. Then Sidney Goldring took over, a great scientist, a great surgeon, an epilepsy surgeon, really pushed that forward. And then I took over in 1989, and um, I've just so much enjoyed my career here at Wash U. It's a, just an absolutely wonderful environment to work in. I love St. Louis, brought up both of my children here, uh, and uh, it's just a, a great, a great place. Um, our traditions here are of training the future academic leaders of our specialty. And in the past 30 years, we've trained many people who are now holding important positions as faculty members in, in great academic programs around the country. And a significant number of them are actually leaders, division directors, vice chairman, uh, chairs uh, of departments, including Dr. Zipfel, who, although he didn't take his residency here, I claim him as somebody that I worked with for so many years. Now, we are very, very interested in achieving technical excellence in our um, trainees. This is a large frame and magnum meningioma that I respected 
with about a year ago with one of our chief residents. Um, he did about, I'd say, 65% of the case. It took us about nine hours to get it out safely. Uh, we had to be very careful of the contralateral vertebral artery, which I dissected there. And, you know, our, our goal is to have people ready to do huge cases like this when they get done uh, and, and really make sure that they get a lot of technical experience starting at very early stages in the residency. And it follows up in the Ireland experience where they get uh, extreme amounts of autonomy, being sort of the neurosurgeon on call for the whole country uh, on a weekend. And uh, the whole package is very, very good from a technical standpoint. We also emphasize training surgeon scientists either to do fundamental research, translational research, be interested in clinical trials and clinical research, and then also develop devices in combination with engineers and scientists that can be applied to uh, neurosurgery. Those four uh, areas of investigation are very, very important to us. Dr. Zipf will talk about that. What do I think are the defining characteristics of our program? Well, first of all, I think that we have broad and deep expertise across all the specialties of neurosurgery. We have a very, very large bench in skull base, brain tumor, cerebrovascular, spinal neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery. I think we have the, the best pediatric neurosurgery group in the country. And we have outstanding functional and stereotactic surgery with incredible innovation and devices being uh, developed here, which Dr. Zipf will go over. The second thing that I think is very nice about our, our program is that we are very um, lucky to have great facilities in a very small geographical area. And the importance for this is it gives us a lot of coherence in terms of all being a team, being able to make conferences. Um, you don't spend a lot of time driving around the city, um, uh, getting back and forth. And it really adds a lot, I think, to the culture here. And we have great new facilities that are going up all the time. And the great thing is that in a couple of years, we're gonna have a new 500 square foot neuroscience research building um, which is really gonna be exciting because it's gonna enhance the already great collaborations we have with the scientific community here, which is just robust and very, very much dependent on collaboration all the time. And finally, we have a high volume clinical program, which is embedded in a great biomedical research university. We have incredible technology uh, robotics, intraoperative MRI, the best stereotactic radiosurgery capabilities, microsurgical capabilities. A recent thing that we're working on is uh, laser and interstitial therapy, which uh, we're one of the leading um, groups in the country on this, uh, on Dr. Uh, uh, um, Luthart's leadership. So, you know, I mean, it's really, it's really nice. What we're looking for in a resident is we want people who have demonstrated the capability to work hard and um, work in a smart way, be productive. We rigorously um, uh, enforce the duty hour restrictions here, but that means we need to, we're busy. You all want to really develop into the best neurosurgeons you can be. And uh, that means we need to be efficient in the way we work. And the thing is set up to do that. We want you to be curious about and interested in technology and science. And these are the foundation of our specialty. And that's a big part of our, our residency here. And we also want people who are collaborative team players who are nice people and want to take great care of their patients and their fellow residents and other team members. You know, um, Dr. Ziffel and I have thought a lot about how residents evolve in the clinical research and leadership domains through their residency and afterwards. And if you want to read 
some thoughts on this, you can go to the August 2018 uh, issue of the Journal of Neurosurgery and read about this in some more detail. But we're very committed to that. And now um, I've stepped down. Dr. Zipfel has taken over. We're really excited about this. Let me just say a couple of things about him. Dr. Zipfel is here as the chairman now because a very, very serious uh, international search took place about 18 months ago and identified him as the best person in the country to take this job. And undoubtedly, he is that person. He's an outstanding technical cerebrovascular surgeon, aneurysm surgeon, ADM surgeon. He is an outstanding surgeon scientist with basic science expertise, a huge amount of NIH grant funding, a great clinical researcher. He's an advocate for the residents. Um, he's vitally concerned about having his residents be absolutely the best they can be. And he's a great leader here at our university, in the National Institutes of Health, in the AANS and CNSCD section, in now the Society of Neurological Surgery and at the Journal of Neurosurgery. So he's a really terrific leader and I'm so excited for the future. You know, I um, envy you all uh, applying for neurosurgical residency training programs because I wish I could come back and, and uh, be a resident again. It may sound crazy to you, but I really believe that because the technology and the science you have um, are just so exciting. Uh, and it's going to be great, really great to uh, be a neurosurgeon in the next uh, um, 20 or 30 years. So thanks, Greg. Thanks for letting me uh, speak. And I uh, appreciate it. I'm sorry about the video glitch. Got to unmute there. Thanks, Ralph. I appreciate it very much. Sorry about that. Um, so that's a great introduction and, and, and kind of gives a, a lot of, you know, kind of a foundational perspective in terms of what, you know, what this department, you know, has, where it's been and, and where it's gone. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of that. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, can you all see that? Sophie, does that look right? Yeah, it's good, Greg. Yeah, okay. All right. It's not presenter mode. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's, in, it's good. It's good. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about WashU and and as Dr. Dacey uh, mentioned, um, it's kind of hard to believe, but but it's been over a hundred years of neurosurgery here at WashU, and uh, and I, and I'm only the fifth chair that that you know that that has been here, uh, and uh, you know I, I I take that you know exceedingly seriously, humbly, and uh, and and realize that I have a you know a, a legacy you know that really needs to be uh, uh, maintained and fostered and promoted in the years to come. So. It's, it's a it's a it's a big task and something I take very seriously. Uh, uh, and uh, what I thought I'd share with you is a little bit of my own perspective about where we're going to go in this fifth iteration of the Department of Neurosurgery, and and talk about the WashU way, uh, which in many you know, in many respects nowadays is really the Daisy way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but to understand where we're going, I think you need to have a little bit you know a detail of of, of the past. And Dr. Dacey hit, hit on this already. Uh, there's a great book here that was written by one of our uh, longtime professors named Dr. Grubb uh, that uh, uh, you know, uh, is really a, a great historical reference that I've read through and has a lot to do with WashU and the Department of Neurosurgery. And through that, you can really get a feel for what Dr. Sachs, Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Goldring, and then Dr. Dacey uh, brought to bear at, at WashU in the terms of, of neurosurgery. So we are a historically great Department of Neurosurgery, which I think is important uh, in terms of uh, you know, what we are able to accomplish. I think things can kind of go in waves, uh, but when you have that type of history, it just suggests that you know, what you can achieve is, is at a very, very high level. Uh, really briefly, Dr. Sachs was uh, uh, actually the first professor of neurological surgery in the world. Um, he was also a charter member of the Society of Neurological Surgeons, as Dr. Dacey uh, mentioned, and had a whole host of other accomplishments I don't have time to go through. But a real, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, originator uh, of the field. Dr. Schwartz um, 
had a whole lot of uh, uh, firsts, including developing uh, uh, what's called a crossover aneurysm clip. And if you ever look at that, it looks very reminiscent of the types of clips that we use today. He also developed uh, many uh, technical pr uh, procedures, including the medullary tractotomy for intra intractable cancer pain. But probably what Dr. Schwartz is best known for is uh, developing a really new approach uh, to resident training that be really became the model around the entire United States. If you look at places around the country that have a, a combination of outstanding clinical experience, but built in fundamental uh, basic research training, that's all modeled after the Wash U uh, uh, model that Dr. Schwartz uh, developed. And, uh, and that was the real key there, uh, the combination of clinical training with fundamental basic research, which at the time was novel uh, and, uh, and was not the way things were done. And what led to that is just a historic run of training some of the best uh, academic neurosurgical leaders in the country. And you can see the numbers there uh, with almost half of the residency trained uh, ultimately becoming uh, chairs of, of other departments. So big, big history there and legacy. Then Dr. Goldring came through and he, he I actually, I, 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 you know, what's interesting about him is uh, it, it, it really is the harbinger of what has now become a defining, I think a defining part of Wash U, which it has to do with being at the cutting edge of technology and, and applying that to neurosurgical conditions. So for example, he was the first uh, physician uh, along with uh, his partner neurologist um, to uh, get the link computer, which was the first personal computer from the NIH, the very first one in the country. Um, and he used this to compute evoke potential responses for cortical localization. He's very well known for the development of methods to map the somatosensory cortex in non-awake patients, and also known for developing methods for EEG monitoring in awake patients outside the operating room. And uh, this was cutting edge neurotechnology, neuroengineering uh, of his era. And I think it really is uh, set a foundation for what we're doing today, which I'll share in a bit. And that's Dr. Dacey, again, I, I, there's not enough time to go through all the accomplishments, but just real briefly, uh, he's, he, he uh, took his microcircuitory uh, pathophysiology and physiology training in, uh, from the University of Virginia and had a 30 year plus uh, uh, run uh, of NIH funded research where he really defined uh, the physiology of the microcirculation and the pathophysiology of a lot of different conditions that affect the microcirculation, including subarachnoid hemorrhage. He also was a surgical innovator, including being the first to uh, uh, apply uh, a, 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 a device that automated high, high flow ECIC bypasses in humans. Uh, but I think what he's been best known for uh, uh, is really dramatically expanding and modernizing the clinical enterprise at Wash U while also continuing to grow uh, not only the basic research but also translational and clinical research programs. So a lot of history there. Uh, and that gets us to the, to the present. And I'm gonna show a bunch of where we are today Everything is built on what Dr. Dacey, you know, did over the past 30 years, and I've had a little bit of a contribution the past year. Uh, so really, this is uh, largely what Dr. Dacey accomplished is what I'll be presenting now. And what I would say is that we have a tremendously dynamic, uh, upwardly mobile uh, 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 faculty. Uh, I'm the chair now uh, uh, for the past year, and then Dr. Uh, uh, Limbrick, uh, the, uh, the gentleman to the left, uh, is the executive vice chair of the department. He's also the uh, division chief of pediatric neurosurgery. Um, and he is an absolute superstar within pediatric neurosurgery and beyond. Uh, uh, and is really a national leader in a lot of different ways uh, uh, from organized neurosurgery. So he's a tremendous asset. And really I view it that, that he and I are co-leading this department in many ways now. And then to the right there is Dr. Zach Ray. Uh, he's a, a vice chair of the department as well. And he's now the new uh, division chief of spine, which we formed this year. And he is a superstar. Uh, 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 he's uh, the, the busiest uh, surgeon we have in the department, technically outstanding, uh, complex surgeon, peripheral nerve surgeon, um, and, uh, and also DOD funded, R01 funded, and, and, a, and a real national leader moving up the chain in, in the, three in the uh, spine section and just a tremendous leader. So the three of us are, are really the, leading this department at this point into the future. Uh, we're lucky to have uh, Dr. Dacey, as well as Dr. Um, uh, Keith Rich and Dr. Uh, T.S. Park. Uh, Dr. Rich is the one in the middle and, and Dr. Park is the one to the right. Now, Dr. Dacey and Dr. Uh, uh, Rich are, are no longer surgically practicing, but they're still seeing patients uh, and are very active in the department. And Dr. Dacey has uh, really taken on another role uh, 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 with resident education, which uh, has been extremely appreciated by our residents, including and him winning our annual um, uh, uh, teaching award this year uh, uh, for all of his efforts that he's taking on now that he's stepped down as chair. 
We also have a host of leaders in the department. Uh, Dr. Luthart, I'll go from left to right. Dr. Luthart leads our division of neurotechnology that we established this year, and I'll talk more about that. Dr. Albert Kim leads our uh, pro, uh, brain tumor program, and I'll talk more about that. Dr. Dunn uh, is the new residency program director, so he leads that effort educationally. Uh, Dr. Uh, Santiago uh, is the uh, head of our safety efforts. It used to be patient safety, but now with COVID and everything else going on, it's, act, I, it's really uh, safety of all types, including faculty and residents and so forth. And Dr. Willie is our newest director, and he'll be directing our functional program when he gets here September 1. I'll talk more about him in a bit. Uh, and then we also have just a, a, a really uh, deep, deep uh, um, uh, pipeline and, 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 and uh, foundation of neurosurgeons uh, that are uh, in the cranial space, spinal, pediatric, uh, and, and uh, I don't have time to talk about each, every one of them, but they're outstanding technical surgeons. The vast majority have major academic uh, 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 efforts, and I would trust any one of them uh, operating on a family member. Uh, uh, so they're outstanding. And then after that, we have a growing group of uh, PhD scientists that are complementing uh, many of our neurosurgeon-led research programs. Um, and uh, and this, is a, this is a growth area for us, and I think something that you'll be seeing more and more of at WashU in the future. What I'd like to highlight in yellow, these are six people that have been hired in the past year. Uh, Dr. Willie, the two to the, uh, uh, on the second to last line are our new, two new spine surgeons, and I'll talk about them in a bit and three new PhD scientists in brain tumors and, and, and neurotechnology. So a really dynamic faculty. We got a great group of residents. I know uh, if you tuned into previous uh, 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 versions of this uh, 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 series, you heard more about this, but the, the residency is outstanding. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Dacey led it for a lot of years, then I, uh, and now uh, Dr. Dunn and Dr. Osmond. Uh, but we're really thrilled by the, the, the talent, the diversity, the collegiality and cohesiveness that our residents have. We have tremendous uh, case volume, and here's what you can see since Dr. Dacey took over in 1989, starting at around 1,000 cases, and just a steady, steady, and really uh, uh, ascending in the last several years, up to 4,600 in FY19. Before COVID, we were on pace to do 5,100 cases. Obviously, that uh, put a, a, a pause on that, so we're not going to hit the 5,100, but we were really uh, expanding uh, in this past year, and that's going to get restarted, or has restarted as we are uh, you know, uh, fully on uh, uh, operational again after COVID hit. Uh, so we have great uh, 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 volume of cases for all of you to train. We have leading edge tech uh, technologies, and I can't go through all of these, but in pediatrics, we're doing a lot of innovative things in epilepsy, in utero uh, uh, surgery, craniosynostosis, spasticity, in spine and peripheral nerve, very innovative uh, uh, with cranial facial, uh, um, cranial cervical uh, fixation, uh, uh, advances, nerve transfers for a variety of conditions, including spinal cord injury, uh, the, the most maximal invasive spinal deformity type of surgery, but also the most minimally invasive approaches to spinal disease, including uh, recent use uh, of uh, surgical robots over the past couple of years. And then cranial, we're doing a lot of innovative things with uh, expanded endoscopic, minimally invasive approaches, uh, minimally invasive keyhole approaches. Dr. Osmond is a is a leader uh, of endovascular, including uh, one of the uh, earliest uh, uh, adopters of transradial techniques. Uh, Josh, uh, Dr. Osmond and I do a lot of uh, uh, high-level complex vascular uh, surgery, including high-flow bypasses. A uh, very busy neuromodulation program that's going to be expanded under Dr. Willie's uh, 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 leadership. Interoperative MRI, the busiest interoperative MRI uh, center in the United States. Uh, we were the first to ever do a laser ablation uh, case in a, in a patient, Dr. Luthart. We have a big volume in that. And we uh, most recently uh, started a second proton program with what's called a pencil uh, technique for the most fine uh, application of radiation therapy. And it's used uh, in particular for pediatric uh, brain tumors. In addition to this really outstanding clinical enterprise, we have transformative research. And Dr. Dacey can, uh, takes all the credit for this, uh, or should take all the credit for this. Um, in terms of, uh, we, we have the most R01 funded neurosurgeons in the country. I used to say this in the last couple of years, and that was before we recruited Dr. Willie. Um, so he will be the seventh R01 funded neurosurgeon, and that is clearly the most in, in, in the country. So uh, this is a place uh, to get academically trained uh, and do fun, you know, you know, significant, serious PI uh, type of, of research, in addition to being uh, outstanding in the clinical realm. 
Uh, we have many uh, unique investigator initiated clinical trials and you see some of the uh, faculty who are leading that effort. So we have a great, great transformative research program across basic translational and clinical uh, uh, realms. And this has culminated in, an, in a marked increase in our NIH ranking. The red is the number of dollars uh, and the blue is the NIH rank. And in 2018, we had $6.5 million of NIH funding, which put us number seven in NIH funding. Uh, we're a little bit uh, under that in 2019, uh, 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 but, uh, but, uh, but still uh, on a, in a great track. And I can tell you by the recruits that we've, uh, 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 that we've had in this past year, including Dr. Willie, and then, a PhD, and then a, uh, a PhD scientist named Dr. Peter Bruner, who I'll talk about in a second, with the grants that they're bringing in, we will be back into the number seven, number eight range uh, uh, within the next year. And our goal in the next five years is to be in the top five. And I'm really confident that we will be there uh, based on some of our uh, research uh, programs that I'll introduce here in a second. The res residency program is top tier. Uh, I think it's the best in the country. It's certainly a top five. Uh, program, uh, top 10 program in the country. Uh, you can look at this in the different ways. Uh, on the left is a publication that came out a couple of years that compared all the different programs in terms of the resident academic productivity by, uh, by H index, and we were in the top 10. Doximity has been uh, ranking programs uh, for many years now, and we're consistently in the top 10. This year, we're number seven. And almost 70% of our graduates go into academics, many of which become leaders, as Dr. Dacey uh, uh, articulated before. So if you think about who we are now presently, uh, I think there's no, no other way to say that we are uh, an outstanding uh, department, an outstanding residency, and it's really all the credit to Dr. Dacey and the 30 years of build that, he, uh, that, that we're all benefiting from at this time. So let me just have a couple of comments about what got us there, uh, and, then, uh, and then let me have a, a few last uh, uh, slides about where we're going. In terms of what got us there, there's a whole, whole, whole lot to talk about there, but let me just talk about two specific things, two foundational themes that I think run through our program, dating back to uh, uh, Sachs, Goldring, and Schwartz, but certainly emphasized and, and promoted by Dr. Basie. And, that, and one of them is what I would call continuous reinvention. Um, and what that means to me is this is not a static department. It's not a static residency it's always being pushed uh, to another level. We're always looking uh, in an iterative way about how to make it better each and every year. We all do that. Um, and, and that's a lesson we've learned from Dr. Dacey. So it really means to be prepared to reinvent yourself, be prepared to go out on a limb occasionally and be prepared to do things that you really feel strongly about. And if you adhere to this and, and from a department, from residency, from your own individual career, you are going to be better each and every year. And it's that cumulative effect of pushing yourself each and every year or pushing the department each and every year is how you climb the mountain and ultimately you know, uh, achieve and, and, and be at the top of that mountain. And I think that's a key, key tenet uh, for our department. Now, this is not new to our department or our institution. This is what the Amazons, the Netflix, the GEs, and the Apples of the world, that's what they do. That's why they are so good. That's why they're at the top of the, uh, top of the mountain. They're the most successful companies master the art and science of continuous reinvention. They innovate and they adapt to meet the inevitable changes that the world are, are around them brings. Imagine what Apple would have done if they just stuck to the PC. They wouldn't be where they are today. So that's what we do uh, and, uh, and that's what I think is a key tenet of our department. And the other one is this, the defar defining departmental culture. Uh, and I think the culture of a department of an institution really, really matters uh, in terms of where you're, what you'll gain in terms of a training program and what your, how high your career can, uh, can go and how high the, the department of the residency can achieve has a lot to do with the culture. And, uh, and it, you know, it's, I like this quote, you can have all the right strategy in the world, but if you don't have the right culture, you're dead. And I think that's really what Dr. Dacey uh, has uh, uh, imbued uh, in our department over 30 years and we benefit from it uh, daily. Um, the department uh, culture, I think, uh, breathes life into an organization and it drives the behavior. It drives resident, faculty, uh, staff uh, uh, behavior. And that's why uh, our department has achieved it the, way, the way it has. So with that, I just well, I thought I'd take a few last slides to look into the future. Where are we going? Uh, and uh, and I, now I have about a year under me so I can give you some of where we have already gone the first year. But let me just give you my overarching vision for where I want the department to go and how I see ourselves. One is we want to make a difference every day. We want to do that with our patients and their families in terms of the type of leading edge, subspecialty specific patient-centered care we provide. But we also want to do that by how we treat our, co, uh, our, co, our colleagues, 
our residents, our staff, our nurses, our NPs, uh, the OR staff, uh, the, our, our colleagues in neurology and critical care and, and the ED. We wanna make a difference each and every day and it really drives us uh, uh, to perform every day. At the, same time, at the same time, we wanna make an even better, a greater difference tomorrow and how are we gonna do that? Well, we need to uh, be the leaders of new technology. I'll give you one example here in terms of one of our recruits who's bringing augmented reality uh, to spine surgery and I think in the future to cranial surgery. We did that on purpose. We found someone who's doing something new and brought him into our department to make us better. We're performing transformative research and I've talked a little bit about that. And that's the pipeline for how to, uh, uh, to be, provide better care in the future and, and, and make a, better, a greater difference. And we are preparing the next generation of academic neurosurgical leaders. And there's no doubt in my mind that the people coming out, or, out of our program you know, are gonna be you know, the, the, the leaders of, of tomorrow for sure. And, and it's something actually, of all, of all the things that I've talked about so far, it's the part of my career that I, I actually get the most pride out of is the residents and the fellows that come through our program and what they achieve. So with that, I'll just give you a little bit of, you know, how we're gonna get to, to that vision of making a difference today and tomorrow and the progress we have to date. So I have four strategies that I'll, I'll share with you today. One is we need to transform and grow the clinical enterprise. And this is through initiatives and partnerships with our hospital system called BJC and partnerships with allied departments like neurology and radiology and orthopedics. So one is we've established a brain tumor center of excellence. Uh, so we've kind of pulled all these pieces that we had together and we formalized a structure of organization and leadership. And you can see all the partnerships uh, that we have there. And the key is this is not led by only neurosurgery. This is an interdepartmental effort led by Dr. Kim on the left, uh, the head of our brain tumor program, but also with uh, Dr. Campion and Dr. Huang of medical and radiation oncology. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is a huge, huge focus of ours. We're building on some real strengths within our department and outside our department, but this is going to be a real growth area for our department in the years to come. We also established a Wash U integrated spine service. So it's not orthopedic spine and neurosurgery spine, you know, fighting it out and duking it out. We have partnered together, uh, myself and Dr. Ray on the left and Dr. Uh, O'Keefe and Dr. Bohowski, the orthopedic uh, chair and division chief on the right, uh, as well as partnering with the hospital um, to make this happen. And this, we're at the early stages, but I'm absolutely convinced that this type of, of, of partnership with orthopedics rather than competition with orthopedics is how we're going to uh, rise the, the, whole, the whole pie and we're all gonna do better uh, and, and accomplish more by working together. So this is a, a big part of our future. Part of that is hiring two new spine surgeons. Dr. Molina uh, uh, trained at Johns Hopkins for medical school, residency and infolded fellowship. And uh, he just joined us two weeks ago and in his first Two weeks, he did 15 uh, uh, spine cases, many of which were uh, very complex. And, and uh, already I can tell he's gonna be an absolute superstar. Uh, Dr. Penny Cook uh, trained at MGA, or uh, trained at Harvard for medical school, trained at Cornell for residency, and he just completed his uh, uh, complex spine fellowship at uh, uh, UCSF and will be joining us uh, next month uh, as our second uh, new recruit from spine surgery perspective. He's outstanding and uh, gonna be focusing in on MIS uh, an MIS deformity type of uh, cases. He's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, individual that we're really happy that he is joining us as well. So the spine group is expanding. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Molina brings this special uh, uh, technology uh, and we are in the last stages of finalizing a contract to bring this here called Augmented Reality and the company's called Augmetics. And what it is is, is a device that you, it's a headset um, that allows you to percutaneously uh, or uh, minimally invasive open uh, place uh, uh, screws and other instrumentation uh, stereotactically without having to look up at the monitor. You're looking through the headset, it, it's projecting uh, uh, your uh, trajectory uh, in right in front of you and will speed up the cases and improve accuracy. The first cases were done at Hopkins where he trained uh, just a month ago and we are gonna be the second site. And Dr. Molina it was the thought leader behind that technology uh, in partnership with Dr. Nick Theodore at Hopkins and, uh, and, and we're gonna be bringing uh, uh, this technology to Wash U very, very soon. And it's just an example of how we're always pushing the envelope uh, to make sure we have the latest technology available. Um, I'm happy to uh, report that we recruited Dr. John Willey. Uh, now John Willey is well known to us. He trained at Wash U. Uh, he's an MD PhD from UT Southwestern, uh, trained with us as a resident and then did a fellowship at Emory and has been a faculty member there for eight years. And he's gonna, uh, come back to be uh, our inaugural director of the Stereotactic Functional and Epilepsy Surgery Program. 
He's R01 funded, extremely innovative in the area of neuromodulation and epilepsy, and he's going to uh, expand our already high volume uh, epilepsy and, and DBS uh, program uh, in a lot of innovative ways. So I can't wait to, he, he, he arrives September 1 as well. So that's going to be a great addition. We are in the process of uh, expanding our stroke and cerebrovascular center, um, uh, including uh, establishing a thrombectomy stroke center at one of our community hospitals. We're currently recruiting a, a, a second dual trained neurosurgeon and neurology is recruiting uh, an interventional neurologist. So the stroke and cerebrovascular program is exceedingly uh, strong, I believe, uh, and, uh, but we are looking uh, to, to expand it even further. So that's the clinical enterprise. Uh, strategy two is accelerating the research momentum that I showed you on that graph over the past five or 10 years. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna transform what are primarily neurosurgeon-led research programs and build those out into multi-investigator hubs of investigation with PhDs that have complementary expertise uh, 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 in the areas of brain tumor and neuroinnovation and functional and vascular. I'll give you one uh, a big example here uh, I established uh, what probably is the first division of neurotechnology in the country. And I'm building on the tremendous strength of Dr. Luthard. I'm sure many of you have heard his name. Uh, uh, if not, you should look him up. Uh, he, is a, uh, 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 he is just a, a world beater in the area of entrepreneurship, neuroengineering, neurotechnology. Um, and uh, I've asked him to build out a division uh, in, the, in that area, partnering with our engineering colleagues on the undergraduate campus. Dr. Luthart uh, is well known for his uh, ex expertise in brain computer interface, advanced brain imaging uh, and mapping, uh, uh, and also uh, the application of laser interstitial thermal therapy for a variety of conditions, including brain tumors. And what he has done is already hired two great people. One is Dr. Peter Bruner, who's a PhD scientist coming from the uh, University of Albany, very, very well NIH funded already, uh, uh, and a real leader in, in the area of uh, large scale cortical electrophysiology. And, you, and, and leveraging that into new devices to treat or diagnose a, a, a variety of neurological conditions. And he's gonna be a huge addition to our department. He starts October 1. And then it, we co-recruited uh, Mayo Sinez uh, uh, along with uh, biomedical engineering um, uh, to uh, 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 build out a brain spine, uh, a brain spine interface uh, program. Uh, and he's gonna be really building out the division of neurotechnology. And we are actually are recruiting a third PhD scientist as well. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're innovative, if you're interested in, in uh, 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 that, uh, that area of neurosurgery, there is no better place for you than Wash U, I promise you. Uh, I already mentioned uh, Dr. Willie. Um, he has R01 funded research program in, in the neuromodulation, post-traumatic post stress disorder, enhancing learning and memory, and, 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 and uh, mapping uh, emotional circuitry in the limbic system. And, our neuromodulation program is really going to take it, take it to another level with Dr. Willie's leadership. And then finally, we're, we're uh, establishing a, a brain tumor research center within the Brain Tumor Center of Excellence. And we are co-localizing eight existing brain tumor scientists from four different departments at Wash U. And this will all be co-localized in 2023 with the new neuroscience research building that Dr. Dacey mentioned. This is the 3D rendering of what it's gonna look like. And this is a, a webcam shot from this morning and you see the crane and the, and the hole in the, in the ground where this is being built. And again, Q1 or Q2 of 2023, this will be open and neurosurgery research, including the Brain Tumor Research Center is moving there. And, it, and, and this is gonna be tremendously exciting uh, for us in the future. We're also recruiting a world-class brain tumor scientist to, to direct that Brain Tumor Research Center, and, uh, well, as well as three additional brain tumor scientists to kind of complement what we already have, uh, which is a major strength. Now, the last couple things are quick. Uh, we're going to maintain and grow what I think is the foremost neurosurgical training program in the country. Uh, I've asked Dr. Dunn to the left and Dr. Osmond to the right uh, to direct that program. We're going to continuously, iteratively uh, improve the program, uh, and, and, and already that's happening with some changes that they've made in the past year. And we are intent on attracting the brightest and most diverse candidates possible uh, into our program. And finally, we're going to sustain and grow our defining departmental culture. And what that means is maintaining, enhancing what I call the Wash U way, which in many ways is the Daisy way. And again, we're gonna enhance our defining dep departmental culture, and we're gonna vigorously adhere to that Wash U way that I've described in this presentation. So 1.0, uh, Wash U Neurosurgery 1.0 was the Sachs era, where he really helped create the subspecialty of neurosurgery from general surgery. 2.0 was uh, Dr. Schwartz, and he established the template and set the bar for academic neurosurgical training that we really are all following since that time. 
3.0 was under Dr. Goldring, where he advanced computational and surgical techniques for the management of epilepsy and other conditions. 4.0 was the past 30 years under Dr. Gacy, where, where I believe he reinvigorated and advanced the Wash U way while always serving as the quintessential servant leader. In the area, era that we're in now is 5.0, and what I'm trying to do is build upon what is historically a great, great department uh, at one of the premier academic medical centers in the country. A real, you know, uh, a real, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, it's just a, a, a pleasure to have that type of opportunity because uh, that's a very few uh, uh, types of opportunities like that come along. We're going to promote innovative, leading edge surgical care. We're going to uh, do uh, transformative research. We're going to maintain the residency as the foundation for the department upon all uh, uh, everything else is built. Um, and really what I view it as, you know, I was, I inherited this. This was, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years in the making. And it's, it's a top tier, you know, sports car, if you want to use that analogy, but it is absolutely a top tier department and program. And I'm going to do my best in the next 20 years to make it a bit better. So with that, uh, again, thank you for joining us. And I think we can open it up for some questions uh, at this point, if you have any. So thank you. Hey, I have some questions if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Um, Maybe introduce yourself a little bit br briefly and then ask a question if you don't mind. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm Harrison Snyder. I'm a fourth year at UVA, so um, got the UVA shout outs there. Um, yeah, thanks so much for doing this. Really enjoyed it. Um, I, I was kind of wondering uh, for, for, you know, prospective residents that are really interested in going into research, uh, I'm kind of wondering what sort of some of the mentorship looks like that residents receive throughout the training um, as far as research goes. Um, sure. it'll help kind of identifying good projects to work on, how to kind of structure their research years in order to get yeah. the most out of research or translational science they do, things like that. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Harrison. I like your name, by the way. My, my son's name is Harrison, uh, so that's, that's good. Um, we have a really, really robust uh, uh, infrastructure and kind of uh, uh, all the bells and whistles to, to make uh, resident research absolutely as productive as possible. I, I can't imagine, I really truly can't imagine a, a, a department that has the structure put up the, that we have to, to help nurture and mentor uh, people who are in, into neurosurgeon scientists. There are other places that can compete with us in terms of the overall amount of academic productivity they have, but I don't believe they can compete with us in terms of you know, how we prepare people to be surgeon scientists. So let me just give you a couple of things and I'll, I'll, I'd love to hear Dr. Dacey's uh, uh, comments on this as well. So one is we have an R25 program uh, that, that we got about seven years ago, uh, renewed two years ago. Um, and that program is a foundational piece. It's an NIH grant um, that uh, you know, kind of gets you in the club. Uh, and then once you're in the club, then your residents can apply for uh, funding through the NIH uh, for up to two years of, uh, of funding for your research as a resident. We've had multiple residents do that. Uh, you go to an annual retreat, uh, and you get plugged in with the NIH, it's a great program and, and we're one of the few programs that have that type of uh, uh, effort. It used to be neurosurgery only, although two years ago we did expand it and it's now co-directed with uh, myself as well as a neurologist. We also developed what we call the NRMG program, which is Neurosurgery Research Mentorship Group. And what we did probably about seven years ago or so, eight years ago, I realized at the end of the year, these, these semi-annual meetings we have with the residents, there's just so much packed in with milestones and, and uh, competencies and minimum case volume. We weren't mentoring them as well as, I, as, as Dr. Dacey and I wanted to. So he and I brain, brainstormed and we decided let's pull out some of the research mentoring for those residents who are PGY threes and fours who are heading into their research years and PGY fives and sixes that are in their research years. And let's every quarter meet and we got a bunch of NIH funded neurosurgeons and that, that, that are faculty for it, plus a bunch of non-neurosurgery PhD scientists who come to it as well. And the threes and fours, they present their ideas about what they want to do. We help shape it, have them go back to their mentor, or have them go back to the, the drawing board a little bit and, and kind of make it better. We review their grants, we review their aims. And then once they're in the research years as fives and sixes, they present their work in an in a, in a in a, in a informal, you know, you know, a, 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 uh, 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 you know, familiar place where they can present their work. We give them some uh, critiques and, 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 and push them a little bit left and right in terms of what they're doing and, and help shape what they're doing uh, during their research years. So that's an example. I think about 14 years ago, uh, we established a, re a resident research symposium, which is an annual event 
where all the re residents, all the residents, PGY three and up, uh, present what they've done from a research perspective over the past year, and we make a whole big deal about it. We in, uh, invite in a a, 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 a a keynote speaker who is a you know senior, very accomplished uh, researcher, neurosurgeon researcher. We give out basic science awards and clinical awards. We make a really big deal about it, uh, and it's really just another place for the residents to present their work, get some critiques and get some awards and get some accolades for all the great work that they're doing. So those are three things that we do, but maybe Dr. Dace, you could talk a little bit about Wash U and just the mentoring and nurturing environment that we have even beyond neurosurgery here. Yeah, well, thanks, Greg. Harrison, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, I, I'll just answer it briefly by saying, Dr. Zipfel about 12 years ago or so, established this um, structure we have where we proactively optimize the, the resident's clinical and academic um, uh, achievements. With a, it, and we plan it out. I mean, uh, he sits down and the other leaders sit down and we say, okay, what do you wanna do? Here's how you're gonna do it. And we check and, and follow your progress. So it's a very, very deliberate thing. And that's the, to summarize everything he said, that's really what it is and it's really, and as he said, it's unique. Let me also add something else to what Dr. Zipfel said. Um, you need to all realize that he and I don't sit around and tell each other how great we are all the time. In fact, most of the time, we make fun of each other and jerk each other around. So you, you probably, you know, I know he's been very nice to me, but uh, but don't don't um, get uh, you know think that we we do that all the time because we don't. Any other others have questions? I think you're still on mute. All right, or maybe. I think Valvender is trying to ask a question, but we can't hear you. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah, you're not on mute, but we can't hear you. Maybe type it? You type it in chat box, we can do it that way. Yeah. Is this any better now? Oh, yeah. Perfect. My apologies for that. I'm Ball. I'm one of the fourth year medical students, MD, PhD here at uh, University of Minnesota. Um, Dr. Dacey and Zeipel, thank you guys so much for this opportunity and your time. Um, given kind of the really long and mark you've made over this neurosurgery careers that you two have, have had, what are some of the like experiences and lessons that you kind of resonated with as your time in, in training in neurosurgery? Well, I mean, I'll go first, I guess. I, I would say, um, I would say uh, one of the lessons, and, and, or I get, one of the lessons I have learned or, or, and have appreciated, and one of the things I think we look for in residents, uh, and, and, and now in my position now at faculty members, is passion. I mean, uh, the people who accomplish uh, are passionate about what they do, where they want to go, um, and, and, and they're, and they're really, you know, inquisitive and curious, but that's not a lot, but that's not it. <laughs> you got to have passion. You got to be curious. Um, but you also have to be dogged and strategic. Um, and I've said this to numerous residents or faculty over the years, but, you know, I have definitely seen, you know, some of the smartest people who are passionate, who have great ideas and, and, you know, I'm sure are smarter than me, a lot smarter than me, but if you don't partner that passion and that curiosity and that, and those great ideas with kind of a doggedness and, a, and, and, and an ability to strategically set out, what do I need to accomplish this week? What do I need to accomplish this month? What do I need to accomplish this next six months? What do I need to accomplish in junior residency? Because if you don't do that, all of a sudden you're halfway through and you're like, I haven't done, you know, I, I had these great ideas, but I haven't moved the ball forward. So it's really what I, where I think the people who are the most successful is they're passionate, they're curious, they're smart as hell, and they want to, you know, and they want to, you know, make a difference in the world, but they're strategic and they're dogged. They're not going to let anything stop them, and they're going to move the ball forward on a daily basis, because if you don't do that, seven years goes by, you're smart, you can, you know, yeah, yeah you, you can operate and you can do all those things, but in terms of what you really were trying to do in terms of making an impact and making a, 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 a difference in neurosurgery and in neurosurgical patients, you'll have missed an opportunity because you didn't have that doggedness and that, uh, and that, uh, 
and that's you know strategic thinking. So I think it's the combination of those two things that we're looking for. Do you have thoughts, Dr. Dacey? Yeah, just to add to that, you know, um, that's a really good question. And I'll tell you, for me, it was the fact that my mentor, Dr. Jane at the University of Virginia, who has mentored a lot of other neurosurgeons in this country, um, the, the best thing about him was he's this unbelievably terrific um, technical and clinical neurosurgeon. But at the same time, he had a lot of experience in uh, doing scientific investigation and being the editor of the Journal of Neurosurgery. I mean, he was an absolutely perfect person to be a model for what we all want to be. You know, we want to have, we want to have a great stimulating practice. We want to take care of our patients. And we want to do it in the most, you know, the best way possible. And, you know, we've got a lot of people here on the faculty that Greg just mentioned that, um, that, that do that. So I th that's how I'd answer your question. Let me also answer the question on the chat from Jose. Um, does this program involve any global or outreach medical missions? Well, there are two things I'd answer with that. One, Dr. Limbrick uh, and Dr. Keith Rich I uh, had an unbelievably successful and terrific program in Haiti and um, the Dominican Republic in bringing endoscopic third ventriculostomy to patients that need it in those two countries. Couldn't be done by the neurosurgeons that were there. Um, and he, that, it's just an unbelievable story of how, you know, um, developed world technology was successfully uh, uh, adapted to do, to do it in uh, the developing world. So, you know, really inspiring and you need to find out more about that from, from now. And let me just also say that uh, we sent our people to Ireland, as you know, and that's, I think that's a great situation because it's a fundamentally different uh, country, obviously. It's a fundamentally different way of delivering medical care. And you can see the good things and the bad things about that. And it's very, very important for all of us to understand those important differences uh, as we anticipate healthcare reform in this country. So, so I, I'd, I'd say there are lots of international things that are relevant to your question, Jose. Well, let me just add to that um, and then I'll move on to that. There's a question from Kevin from the University of Arkansas who I'll answer in just a second about the research years. But let me add one last piece about the global outreach. So there is what I would say humanitarian outreach uh, to Haiti, Dominican Republic. Uh, there is an international you know, component to our residency training that virtually all the residents participate in in Ireland. But the other thing is, you know, we do have uh, people who are doing, uh, and we do have research uh, that is extending well beyond the borders of the United States. Uh, Dave Limbrick uh, 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 um, is, is a collaborator with uh, Ben Worf and, 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 and Steve Schiff. And, and some of these people who are literally in Africa getting uh, CSF samples from hydrocephalus and, 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 and DNA from patients and, and that. So they have an international data bank uh, of hydrocephalus uh, uh, patients, often post-infectious hydrocephalus patients from the developing world. And he's one of those uh, people who was involved with that global health uh, uh, effort as it relates to hydrocephalus. Uh, I have a, a, a consortium uh, that uh, we started several years ago, along with Dr. Osmond and others here, where uh, we, we're looking into, we're very interested in dural AV fissiles. What's well, an international uh, consortium, including five uh, uh, international sites, uh, some in Europe and some in, uh, in Asia, uh, along with a bunch of uh, uh, North American sites. And so you can get involved uh, 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 from an international perspective there. And, and there are other examples of that. So I think even in a research perspective, we're, we're, we're we're reaching beyond our borders as well. Let me, let me answer uh, Kevin's question about, the question is this, are the research years limited to only third year and beyond or could we start beforehand? So that's a great question. So, so uh, for the residency is an internship first year, uh, second, third and fourth year are clinical years primarily. Uh, uh, um, and I'll get to, you can do research, they, almost everybody does do research during those years, but, but they, they are clinically based. Our fifth and sixth year are our research years, and it's also the time that people go to Ireland uh, for their elective. That was done by Dr. Dacey a long time ago because the idea was try to backload the research closest to when you're finishing training so it's most relevant 
as a faculty member so you can build upon it from a, a K award and career development perspective. If you do your research in years two and three, for example, and then you get four or five years of clinical training, it's outdated. Uh, but if you do your research in your fifth and sixth year, your fundamental kind of core research in your fifth and sixth year, it sets you up for K-12 award. And if you don't know what that is, I'm a co-director co of it. I'm, I'm happy to talk with you about it. Uh, you know, it's the neurosurgical K uh, mechanism. Um, and then there's KO8s and K23s, which is the traditional NIH career development awards. But having the research late helps with that because your work is relevant. But certainly people are doing research uh, even in the first and second year um, uh, because so many of the people that we, that we wind up attracting as residents are, that, are, are like that. Now they tend to be more clinically based, uh, you know, case series, uh, case reports, book chapters. Um, but some are able to uh, utilize past more fundamental research expertise uh, and, and continue that work uh, even in those early, uh, uh, even in those kind of more clinically oriented years. Uh, what I was referring to in year three is, in year three is when you really have to get your research programs going and, and really fleshed out, identify your mentor, what's your project, what are the aims gonna look like, and you gotta start writing by the end of your third year because most of the grants that our residents apply for the R25, American Brain Tumor Association, and uh, AHA grants, NREF grants, most of those are due in the, in the, in the uh, fall. So if your research starts as a PGY-5, you apply in the fall of your PGY-4, which means in your PGY-3 year, you gotta be doing all, the, all your planning. And by the end of your PGY-3, you need to be writing and, and getting ready to submit early in the fall for your PGY-4 year. So that's why the NRMG mechanism I described focuses in on PGY threes and fours and fives and sixes. Now we, they are all, everybody's invited. So ones and twos come too, but threes, fours, fives, and sixes are actually required to come to this because that's kind of the core prep years and core years that you're doing your, your core research, if that makes some sense. So hopefully Kevin, that, 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 that answers your question. Um, maybe I'll open it up to any, any questions on, there's another one from the chat box, but maybe any other uh, verbal questions right now? Hi, my name is Rushi, a uh, fourth year medical student from the University of California, San Diego. I uh, just wanted to say thank you for hosting this program for us. It's been extremely informative. And so my question is relating to, for example, if you have a resident who develops a specific interest within neurosurgery, like spine, for example, which may not be traditionally um, investigated in like a basic science setting, can you maybe speak a little bit about what kind of research avenues they've pursued? And then a quick follow-up question from that is, is there any um, institutional support for like curricular en enrichment for someone who has developed a subspecialty interest? And then how is there, how does that balance between fellows who do exist within the department as well? Sure. Um, go ahead. You want to go ahead, Dr. Biz. I was going to say briefly, you know, um, it's a really good question. Let's say you're interested in spine. Well, you know, the great thing here is that even though spine traditionally hasn't been a Thing where basic research has been done too much. I mean, that's the way it has been in the past, but that's probably not the way it's going to be in the future. For example, one of our recent graduates um, was do, using functional MRI in studies of the connectome to determine how cervical spondylitic myelopathy and severe lumbar pain changes the the network formation uh, in the somatosensory network, particularly um, on functional MRI as determined as part of the Connectome project. So that's just one example of where, you know, you can really expand the horizons here. And there's a lot of support for that kind of uh, research, including money and, and uh, time, you know, so you can uh, uh, approach that kind of thing. So I, the answer to your question is yes. I'll, I'll add two other thoughts. Uh, so that was one uh, 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 resident of ours and, and uh, uh, who was, you know, uh, you know utilized unbelievable uh, uh, expertise here with the connect, human connectome project and applying it to uh, spinal conditions. So, and we would foster that and promote that. And, and many of our residents, we actually encourage them. I really encourage them. We got great research. I mean, I, you know, I said there's seven neurosurgeons with R01s in our, in our department. We got great opportunities within neurosurgery, but I want them to go out and you know seek out neurology, radiology, basic you know from the neurosciences, developmental biology. Go find the best you know the research being done 
and apply it to neurosurgical conditions, there is no expectation, if anything, there's a push to, to make sure you're looking outside of neurosurgical labs in terms of what you might want to do before you make a decision. Uh, two other things, though, in terms of spine, sounds like you have maybe an interest in that. So Dr. Ray, who I mentioned earlier, is the head of our spine division. I mean, he has two DOD grants uh, looking at spinal uh, and looking at peripheral nerve transfer for cervical spinal cord injury patients. Um, he also has an R01 looking at uh, a, a very, uh, it's like, it's like a DTI at, an, at a much higher level. It's called, uh, it's called DSBI. Uh, and, and it's a radiation, a radi a radiation physicist who is the, uh, eva or developed these MR techniques, but he's applying it to cervical myelopathy and spinal cord injury patients as a prognostic tool uh, uh, for these patients uh, utilizing, you know, next level, basically white matter uh, imaging. So, and, and that's NIH funded and DOD funded, and, and that's a big, big part of our program. Um, and I had, oh, and the other thing is the spine thing is interesting. Oh, oh there, so there are two things. One of those recruits in the division of neurotechnology, Mayo Sinez, he's, his work is brain spinal interface. And the idea there is you have a block in the spinal cord because of paraplegia, uh, but then you're going to bypass that block by a brain to lower spinal cord in, you know, a, a computer interface to, uh, to help with ambul ambulation and so forth. He came from a world famous uh, 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 laboratory in Europe. Uh, and now he's gonna bring that, that, those, 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 that expertise here. He starts in, May, uh, in March of 2021. He's not here yet, but he's coming. So there's just a couple of examples. I mean, there is not, like you said, in spine, there's not a lot around the country. Turns out Zach Ray and I uh, are involved with an effort uh, with the AANS and the spine section um, uh, and, and then leveraging our connections within the academy. There's a lot, of, a lot of names here, but the academy is the organization within neurosurgery that drives research more than any other uh, society within neurosurgery. And there's also uh, the NREF, which is the Neurosurgery Research and Education Foundation. They're the one that has the money uh, and can drive funds. And, what the, and the idea is with the academy who drives research, NREF that drives research funds, the AANS and the spine section, what can we do at a national level to better connect people like, sounds like you, who are interested in spinal research with the very few places that have it, like Wash U, but other places like the University of Toronto and, and Pittsburgh and a few other places. How can we do that? Because what we need is, we need a strategy to, 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 from a grassroots level, grow up more and more surgeon scientists who, who, who want to apply their, that expertise to spine. It's a huge you know, societal uh, 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 area that needs to be uh, impacted, but we don't have enough people going into that space. And so but, but what I'm trying to say is because we have a lot of expertise in that area, we are part of the national leadership in terms of what we can do nationally for neurosurgery to get more people in that space. So just a couple other thoughts. Let me, let me answer a question from Sonora Windermere. Um, she asked, what is your strategy for facilitating robust operative experiences in the intern and early resident years while balancing the demands of floor responsibilities? I'll answer that in a couple of ways. First of all, we have a really robust set of nurse practitioners and other people that try to limit the amount of time that you're called on to do pointless tasks on the ward. Um, Obviously, there are things that uh, the residents have to do in terms of making clinical judgments there uh, outside of the operating room, but we really have tried to deal with that. And the other thing is our strategy here in terms of operative experience is affected by a number of things. First of all, we have a lot of increase in the size of our faculty now. And what that means, and the number of cases. So what that means is there are more and more opportunities all the time for relatively junior resident levels to be participating as first assistants or the surgeons on cases that um, uh, are being done. In other words, it's not all just done by the chiefs and the senior residents. And we have a deliberate strategy to get everybody as up to speed as fast as they can on the technical stuff. And, and when they go to Ireland and have essentially an independent kind of uh, with supervision, but relatively independent responsibilities over there. And then come back and, you know, as the chief, they drink, you know, through a fire hose that year. And then, um, you know, when they're done, um, these people can cut. And it's very, very 
It's very important to me. It's very important to Dr. Zipfel. And um, we are told by people who are working with our graduates that all these people can really handle themselves in the operating room. So I hope that answers your question, Sonora. Let me, let me add two things to that. One is, uh, this is the best way to answer what type of support we have on the floor. Our new recruit, Dr. Molina, who uh, trained at Hopkins, when I, I walked him through the kind of the ORs and stuff, you know, on one of those first couple of days, and I was kind of, and the, and the floors, and I said, um, so we have, a, you know, he, I introduced him to one of our nurse practitioners, and I said, yeah, so she's one of nine nurse practitioners we have on the adult side, and there's three PAs on the children's side, and, and his eyes, like, they were the biggest eyes he ever seen in his life, you know, about how much support we have. He was just astounded uh, uh, in terms of that level of floor support uh, on both the adult and pediatric side. And I'm sure he was just thinking about every, you know, uh, lab or discharge uh, 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 summary that he dictated uh, during his time. So, and, and I'm not trying to say that, you know, I mean, you know, Hopkins is a great program. I'm not saying anything about that, but the level of support is, I think, very high. Um, that really uh, allows you to kind of minimize those that kind of activities and focus in on, you know, taking care of patients, you know, new consults, making critical decisions, taking care of critical patients, and, and learning how to be a great technical surgeon. So I, I think that's that. The other thing I want to, you kind of maybe, I'm not sure if you were getting at this or not, but the, the one issue is the in, in, is infolded fellows. I don't know if you were driving at that or not. So say early on, you decided you had a really big interest in spine. Is there a way to kind of you know, you may not be asking about that, but I'll address it. Is there a way to kind of structure things in a way that you get a lot of a spine ex experience? Now, like all residencies, residents tend to gravitate to the cases that they're most interested in. And so I think the answer is yes. If you are really interested in vascular, those, pay, those residents miraculously at the end of seven years tend to have more vascular cases than people who aren't interested in vascular. And it happens with peds, it happens with spine. So there is that kind of stuff that happens in most residencies where you can kind of tailor your, your, your experience, surgical experience, to things that you're particularly interested in. So th there is an opportunity for that, for sure. Uh, but we don't do a lot of infolded fellowships. And it's just, it, it's just better just to kind of get that out there. Um, and I'll just tell you why. Um, the, the, there's, there's, there's a couple of exceptions, but generally, we don't do a lot of infolded fellowships. Uh, so it's not like someone has a PGY-5 or 6, instead of doing research, will do uh, spine, you know, dedicated spine year or skull base or, 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 or neuromodulation or something like that. We, we don't do a lot of that. And the reason is this, um, I have found, I'm sure Dr. Daisy can comment on this. There are pe there, most people who come into pro programs like ours, they, they are very interested in academics. Uh, now some are like, no matter where they go in training, no matter what barriers are thrown in front of them, they will be an academic uh, a neurosurgeon. They are gonna get R01s, no matter what the situation is. But I think more people uh, are very interested in it and as long, but it, and if the environment is, 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 is nurturing, it's structured in the right way, you get the right mentorship, you get the right opportunities like grants and R25s and different things like that. And you are, you know, and you go into 18 months up to 24 months in our program of a dedicated research time, it just kind of paves the way and you get excited because you're in it. Um, and you get turned on by it and the creativity of it and the, the, the potential for you to impact and make a a difference that's going to go you know, well beyond an individual patient that you treat. Um, and so that type, that's what we try to design. That's what our program is designed for. But if you, if you do a lot of infolded fellowships, you may have an interest, but then you kind of, well, I, I, I like, I, if I can, you know, maybe I won't need to do my fellowship year and I'll wind up doing this, you know, year of neuromodulation or, or, or spine or pediatric, whatever. And then you, there's, there's a certain group of residents who I don't get that opportunity to really delve deep into topics and research and they miss out and, and, and they actually would have chosen one path, but they choose another path because they just never had that opportunity. So I'm convinced that that happens. Um, and, and that's why, you know, we're really unabashed about, you know, that our program is 18 months of research up to 24 and there's a certain pathway to do that. And we could talk about that separately, I guess. But, um, and with that, now the type of research, we're very open. It doesn't have to be wet lab based. It could be, you know, uh, uh, basic research could be translational research with imaging or genetics, could be very clinically based research. We've had a bunch of people get MPHSs, uh, MPHS degrees. Uh, we've had, you know, one person, one woman got an MBA. I mean, we're open to tailoring it, uh, but we don't do a lot of infolded fellowships because we want people to get that 
research uh, uh, experience uh, because we have found that lots of people are turned on by it and want to incorporate that into their career. But if they miss out on that experience, then they would never know it. And they kind of go down a different path that they otherwise might not. So hope that helps. Any other questions? We're well past our 45 minutes, but <laughs> I'm happy to answer more questions. Dr. Daisy and I love this stuff. So we're happy to answer more questions if you have any. Sounds quiet. All right, we'll end it there. Uh, if you have any other specific questions, happy to email me, happy to email Dr. Dacey, happy to email Dr. McAvoy, who also is on the line. Um, we're happy to follow up uh, with any additional questions uh, uh, that may come to mind after you leave the call. So I hope you all have a great day uh, and uh, congrats on everything you've accomplished thus far. You're, you've picked a great specialty. It's, a, it, it, it's, it, it's fun and it goes by fast. Uh, and, uh, and it's a, a really fun ride. So, so congrats and look forward to meeting with many of you in person at some point, you know, meetings or uh, otherwise. So take care and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Sophie, for organizing.